Have you heard the phrase, sitting is the new smoking? In this episode, I want to let you know about a new product I've put together called Crushing Office Syndrome that deals with the effects of the sedentary lifestyle. It's an online Qigong training product, and I created it for the many professional people I know who spend six to eight hours a day at a desk and suffer from backache, neckache, and stress generally. This product has over 15 Qigong exercises, multiple follow-along routines, and supporting PDFs to help you along. And it leaves you feeling more flexible, more mobile, and mentally fresh. You can find a link to the product in the podcast description, or visit warriorstrategy.com slash products. Again, you can find a link to the product in the podcast description, or just visit warriorstrategy.com dot com slash products thanks hello there this is robin gamble welcome to the scholar warrior podcast now the idea of the scholar warrior has been around for thousands of years across many great cultures and the concept is this that one of the highest achievements in society is to become skilled in the martial arts while also pursuing the scholarly pursuits of painting poetry music philosophy and more. So it's here that I interview martial artists as well as artists in various fields so that you the listener can gain a peek into their techniques, skills and strategies for success. And so that you the listener may gather these gems and apply them on your own path to self-mastery and excellence. Enjoy! Right, so today we have Ben Galley who's a young author from sunny England. Ben has been writing since he was old enough to be trusted with a pencil, and by his early teens, he'd already written three novels. Now, of course, he's much more responsible, and he's been writing and publishing fantasy books since 2010. He's the proud author of 10 titles so far, including one translation and one graphic novel. Uh, As for novels, he started out with the Emanesca series, an epic fantasy comprised of four books, and he took a break to write the comprehensive self-publishing guide, Shelf Help, which I I really like. I like that website a lot as well. Before launching into uh, a new Weird West venture, the Scarlet Star Trilogy. As an indie author, Ben does everything himself. He writes, sketches the maps, manages the publishing, does the marketing, even crafting his own website. So there's a lot to pick his brains on. And when he isn't being an author or a mischief to the local populace, Ben is a frequent guest speaker and lecturer on the subject of self-publishing. So aside from writing and lecturing, Ben dabbles in music, surfing, gaming, cinephiling. I had to look that up. That's not even a real word. (laughs) He likes cinema. (laughs) And apparently... Uh, he owns Acre on the Moon. I do. Okay, yeah. so to, to add a little bit of concept, context, I recently became aware of uh, Ben's work online and I've been deeply impressed by his prolific writing, hard work and insatiable creativity and imagination. So with that, I welcome you, Ben, to the show. Absolute pleasure to be on the podcast. Yeah, in this kitchen in West Worth. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... I'd like to kind of tackle this in three parts. Mm-hmm. Tends to be a good way to tackle things. Always good. So the first thing I'd like to chat about is just to get a little bit of background. Mm. Uh, you know, how did you, you're a young guy, how did you get into writing? So the first thing that I'd like to uh, ask you, as we know you wrote three books in your teens. Mm. Okay, that's, that's something. That's not typical. That's not the other thing. So... Um, when were you first inspired by fiction? I think it was the moment my dad handed me this battered, dog-eared, almost in half, I think it was, this copy of Lord of the Rings, the entire, you know, one, two, and three all in one book, which um, was all really popular in the, in the 60s and 70s. And he, st- he still had it from then, and he just gave it to me. Uh, and the cover was just barely readable. <laughs> and uh, he said, I reckon you'll like this. And that was the moment I thought, hmm, what is this fantasy? Right. Uh, and I think just the idea of this world being you know, made from scratch out of this old guy's mind somewhere, you know, <laughs> in Middle England. Um, and 
the scope of, of the world that he created. And I just suddenly remember thinking, I want to do that. Right. I want to do this. Uh, so devoured The Hobbit after that, then started on Greek and Norse mythology as well. Um, again, because of Lord of the Rings and the, uh, sort of the way that it's, it's heavily based on Norse mythology got me into the mythologies and classics. Um, and then I, instead of you know, just writing little short stories and things like that, I thought, well, no, I've got too many ideas for... Um, oh, sorry, I've got yeah, too many ideas. I have to just put it into a book. And so that was, uh, <laughs> that was called The Canandapore Gang. And I wrote that sort of between 10 and 9. And it was basically a rip-off of Redwall. I'm not sure if anyone <laughs> who listens to the podcast knows that. Brian Jacks' books. Um, yeah, and it was just monkeys in India. <laughs> okay. Sorry, how old were you? Uh, that was between nine and ten. Right. Yeah. So you, you tackled the that's where I tackled. Of nine at the age of nine. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah, and I didn't understand a lot of it, especially with the Greek mythology. Mm. Everyone's like, "Why is everyone falling on their swords in the Iliad and the Odyssey?" Right. I was like, "What does that mean?" Oh, okay. Uh, I realised after asking my dad, so he was always there to clear stuff up. Um, but yeah, that was uh, between sort of nine and ten. I started, and it took a good couple of years to actually finish the thing, right. because you have no idea really how to write when you first start. Um, especially at nine or ten. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I, I just need to compute this. Yeah, <laughs> you wrote you you wrote a fantasy novel mm-hmm. at the age of nine or ten. I started. I started. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, that's the thing. Right. So I, I started it. It took a good couple of years to actually get to um, uh, to something that I would call finished, uh, and then I started instantly on the second one, which was called Thief Lord. Mm. Uh, it was a sequel. And then I started, oh, I can't remember the, uh, the name of the third one because it only had a working title. Uh, and that took me up to sort of 13, 14. Yeah. So I would say probably finished my first proper book. Um, yeah, 12, 11 or 12. So that shows quite an unusual level of commitment yeah. by, 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 <laughs> young, by young kid. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what happens when you don't... When you start, I moved around a lot when I was a kid. Right. Um, and... <laughs> didn't really have many friends right, yeah. <laughs> and so I had a lot of spare time and sat in front of my computer and things like that and obviously right. gaming as well as a massive gamer yeah. um, so it was natural for me to sit in front of a computer for long out you know long periods of time yeah. and I thought well I enjoy writing yeah I got a kick out of it I started writing uh, sorry doing and um, drawing all the books as well drawing all the maps as well uh, and so I was hooked and that was my obsession yeah thank you <laughs> so what were your what were your childhood favourites aside from mm. uh, Lord of the Rings? Oh God, so many. Um, yeah, aside from Lord of the Rings, I used to love the works of C.S. Lewis as well. Again, obviously him and Tolkien, great friends. Um, quite similar works. Um, I used to love a lot of sort of Dickens as well, even though I didn't understand a word of it. <laughs> I just loved the sort of the the quite the, the old-fashioned language, but also Dickensian's sort of what well, Dickens is. Uh, whimsical nature and the names that he gave his characters yeah. so I loved that when I was a, a kid um, yeah so I think I, yeah thanks to my parents to bringing me up on or for bringing me up on those sorts of things uh, aside from that I used to love um, god it's taking me back now I think it was on my bookshelf yeah all the red wall books all of uh, Brian Jacks's books I hope it's Jacks I've always pronounced it as Jacks it might be Jakes <laughs> um, and yeah a lot of sort of the old uh, older fantasy lots of um Robin Hobb, Dragons of uh, Pern as well. Yeah, all fantasy, right. all made up stuff, nothing real. <laughs> so I guess there's a, a little bit of escapism. Absolutely. In there. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I just, I mean, one of my favorite things to do as a child was just, uh, you know, have as little light as possible to still read, sit in my, you know, bed and things like that and just escape right. and just almost fall and tumble into these worlds. And I wouldn't actually realize I was reading after a while. My mind would sort of paint all these pictures. I've always had a very vivid Im- imagination. So, yeah, that's where my obsession of reading and then, you know, writing, that's how it all came mm. about. So, why do you feel fiction and fantasy was important for you growing up? Uh, what, what, what do you think are the benefits and what, what might be the benefits for, for mm. another kid growing up? I think the benefits of, yeah, sci-fi, fantasy um, and anything that's not of this world is, I think it just, it enables you to see outside of the average day that you've got. I think even though the ideas and the, the, the themes and the concepts, you know, in these books might not be actually different from real life, you know, there's always a bit of personal struggle, uh, conflict and things like that, although they translate to, to real life, I think the way that they wrapped up enables a child or, you know, even an adult to see that problem that they might be having in a different way, 
or understand that actually those problems are faced by you know loads of other different people and on different scales and so i think it's a it's a way of sort of escaping from the problem but also or escaping from the real life and, and all its dangers and troubles <laughs> uh, but at the same time just learning something at the same time yeah yeah and i think as well it's just uh, it's it's so fun to just find out what someone else can create and how far someone's imagination can go mm. and how deep i mean that's what i saw from jr tolkien is just i mean i don't know if anyone's ever gone through the appendices at the back of lord of the rings <laughs> like i have you know i was trying to learn elvish at age 10 just from the back <laughs> of the appendices and things like that just because he's gone to that depth yeah. and i think all of the fantasy books that i write now are you know an homage to that in part where i will write anywhere between five and twenty thousand words of notes before i even start writing the book and I don't use half of them. They're all just, you know, little things, uh, countries that I might mention once or twice in a book or, uh, you know, the name of a, you know, an object, a stone or what have you. I will always have those things and dip into them. Um, but I just love creating the worlds. And I think, you know, that, that's another thing that people can get from it. It's just, you know, the depth of imagination and the, the marvel and wonder of imagination. Yeah, it goes deep. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it can be hard to come out sometimes, actually. <laughs> or you have to remember, you know, which world you're actually in once you start writing multiple series. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, did you get any guidance when you when you started writing? Did you, or did, was was there anybody you looked up to, or anyone mentoring mm. you? Or? Um. Mum and Dad um, were good at always giving, well, especially Dad was good at giving me feedback. Uh, but I think they were too worried about curbing my enthusiasm and saying something. <laughs> you know, they'd always, uh, from well, all my memories of like, yeah, it's great, it's good. <laughs> so, I mean, I got encouragement from that, but I think I would have appreciated looking back. I mean, I think it would have been fine for a little more uh, constructive criticism. But aside from that, the only mentor I had um, was an English teacher. Um, and a drama teacher actually, so two teachers that I had that were always very, very keen to see me use my, uh, my imagination and exercise it. Um, the, both of those teachers were the only people in my school, I think, aside from a couple of friends that knew that I wrote anything. Wow. So they were always very keen to sort of see what I'd written um, or ask at least how it was going. Um, but aside from that, I had no sort of constructive you know, feedback uh, you know, formally from like a mentor or you know, it wasn't sort of a session where I could sit down you know, once a week with the teacher and look at grammar and things like that. Um, so no is the answer, <laughs> essentially. Okay. Um, and then I fell away from writing sort of through my you know, uh, 14, 15 and onwards up to 18 and 19. Um, but when I came back, then that's where I thought, you know, I need a, I need a mentor. <laughs> so it wasn't you until did, then. You did find a mentor. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was um, in my readers, um, in you know, friends and family as well. Yeah. Um, and of course, in editors. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. But I always thought my mentors for me were actually, you know, it's, it sounds cheesy, <laughs> but it's true. The mentors that I always had um, were the books and the authors that I, were reading, uh, that I was reading. So, you know, I'd look at how they structured sentences or how they described things. And I'd always sort of take it in as a sponge and then um, exercise out in my own way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's the, I think there's many disciplines where you can take the... Mm. Uh, you know the, the, the alphabet, as, yeah. it, as it were, yeah. and then start freestyling. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What benefits did you get out of out of that when you completed something like that in that early age? Mm. Did, was there a sense of achievement? Oh or? yeah, yeah, yeah. Huge sense of achievement. I mean, they weren't massive, massive novels. I mean, the first one and the, the sort of the, uh, the actually the third one. Uh, well, I think the second one was the biggest. Uh, I was just trying to think of the actual length of it because I think it is actually one of the largest books I've ever written. <laughs> I'm trying to think of it now, but I can't confirm that. Because I think off the top of my head it was 160, but then I think I've beaten it with 180. <laughs> we'll see. Can't remember anymore. Either way, to wind it back. Um, yeah, it's a huge sense of achievement to finish it, or at least it was when I was a kid, um, so I remember. But then at that point I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> so I just right. started writing the second one. It didn't exist. Not, not really, no. It was more, it was vanity publishing. Right. I mean, yeah, I the idea of publishing the self, yeah, has yeah. always sort of existed. But yeah, in terms of a viable concept that we have now, absolutely not. So I mean, my original dream was to be the youngest published author ever. Nice. Um, but the older I got and the more I started writing books, <laughs> the more I sort of, well, the more books I wrote, um, yeah, that dream just sort of fell by the wayside, unfortunately. Yeah. But I think that's what drove me.
mm. to actually you know, keep writing and things like that. So uh, the achievement was just basically in the, in the completion of them. Okay, I want to just uh, switch topics a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now we, we've got a lot of background that, uh, and touch upon like the creative kind of process mm. a little bit. And, uh, but before, before we jump into the creative process, it's fairly obvious you found <laughs> the passion. You, know, <laughs> yeah. you found the passion. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't seem to be you know, necessarily that, that, that easy for, for many people. So, how, I mean, have you got any words of, of, have you got any kind of words about finding your passion? Or if mm. someone asks you, I mean, obviously people meet you and if you can't tell, uh, he's a passionate guy. So people <laughs> probably pick it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do people ask you, how, how do you find your passion or what, what do you say? I, I think you've got to do what makes you happy. And you might not know what that is when you first start it. It might be the most difficult thing in the world to you, but if as long as you give it your all and you actually dig a little deeper and you actually you know understand whatever it is you're trying, who knows what you might discover? I mean, writing for me was a definite passion, but then it didn't. You know, it fell it fell by the wayside. You know, and through if you'd have asked me between fourteen and maybe nineteen twenty, my passion would have been music without without a doubt, and that w writing wouldn't have even been on the actual horizon. <laughs> you know, I would have said oh, I used to write, but now I've given it all that up. Um, so, yeah, you've got to dig a little bit to find your passion if you don't know what it is. Mm. Um, or if you can't immediately think what makes you happy, I think. But yeah, aside from that, it is what, what makes you happy. And I think once it starts becoming work, that's when you might have lost a little bit of the passion and you need to really sort of step back and find out why you fell in love with whatever it is, you know, whether it's painting, writing, cooking, and things like that. So yeah, I would say that's, that's the best way to find your passion. <laughs> or passions, it can be multiple things. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us a time when a strong idea hit you. Ooh, yes. And what were you doing? Where were you? You have to tell us what you were wearing. No, that's fine. I, I can't remember. <laughs> uh, probably, yeah. What day was it? That would usually <laughs> define what I wear. Um, I remember exactly where I was when I got the idea for uh, to start writing again. So this is the moment that I always look back on very fondly as the start of where I am now. I mean, my time was writing when I was 11, 12, 13, and even younger, you know, they were great. Um, and I look back on them very, very fondly as the sort of, you know, real genesis of my love of writing. But the actual application into adult life and the start of my career came from uh, this one moment. And it's sort of been building up. Um, and I'd recently been, been, been given a copy of an incredible book called American Gods by Neil Gaiman. Yeah, just read we, it. We, oh, it's so good, isn't it? Brilliant. Yeah. I, I cannot wait to see it on HBO as well, yeah. which is coming out very soon. But either way, that showed me, well, it reignited my passion for mythology, for fantasy, even though it's not technically, as you know, a, a fantasy novel, it's more weird fiction. Um, but my friend Ollie just gave me this book and he said, I think you'll like this. Because I'd sort of been thinking about, oh, well, I'm getting unfortunately bored of music. And I'd just been studying it and trying to be in bands and make my way as a musician. It wasn't working. Meanwhile, Ollie gave me this book and I read it and devoured it. And I just started having an inkling of getting back into writing. Uh, and I sort of didn't have any ideas to write. And then one day I was watching BBC's Merlin. In fact, it was the very first episode. So it was the, it was the first night it was on. I remember being around my parents' house. Uh, and they went, oh, you like fancy, let's put this on. I went, yeah, why not? And I remember being, and <laughs> you know, no offense to any fans of Merlin, but I remember being so disappointed by it that it was, I mean, it's obviously it's BBC, sort of watershed <laughs> time, but I remember being so disappointed that it didn't have any of the darkness that I was sort of, you know, lapping up from American Gods and other things that I started reading, that I thought, no, nope, I'm going to do this better. <laughs> so, yeah, that was... Um, that was the moment I, I wrote down the words Farden and Emanesca because I've always been able to just conjure words up of, uh, out of thin air and I'll either stick with them or change them later on down the line. But these sort of words just popped into my head and that became the Emanesca series and Farden became the main character 
for the entire series and future short stories and hopefully another series soon. Okay. So yeah, that was the moment where I just remember being sort of In so... Sense, <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> he was so nice and gentle, this Merlin. I was like, no, he needs to be an embittered man with, <laughs> with troubles and uh, you know, a huge amount of responsibility. And that's essentially how I, I molded Farden. Uh, so yeah. that was the moment when an idea just lightning struck, uh, lightning struck me. So that, yeah, that, uh, I can remember similar occasions, and I've heard of other, other creative mm. people saying similar occasions yeah. when they see something and they're just like, I can do this much yeah. better. Ding, ding, ding. Much better than, than what's yeah. being done. Yeah, it's very common for a lot of people. So after the idea hits, then what happens? <laughs> Uh, I didn't watch the rest of Merlin, I can tell you that. <laughs> it was on in the background. My mum saying, are you missing this? Are you watching this? Uh, and I just took out, I think it was my iPad, uh, or I can't remember, I think it was some sort of note equipment, <laughs> and just started writing. And that's always what I do. Um, not the actual you know, words of the book, but I just start planning things. So I came up with m and I realised that should be the country, or the, sorry, the world that it's based in. Uh, and then started writing down all these things, uh, ideas as they came to me, stuff that never ever made it into the series, stuff that did, and just essentially what I call a brain dump onto the page. Um, and yeah, that was that was it. And so from there, I decided I needed to start. And uh, it was roughly 18 months later that I put the, the final punctuation on the final page. So that was a long, yeah. Of the three, of the three. No, God, no. Yeah, the first book, yeah. <laughs> And it was, it was strange for me because at that point, I mean, it, again, music had fallen by the wayside and I, I was getting really sort of um, fed up with not making it anywhere in that industry. Um, but I realized that I could take all of the things that I'd learned through my years of studying music and how to be an independent artist in music and apply them to being an independent author. Um, and then, so at that point, I thought, you know, I need to write this book. And I was also working a, a load of terrible, terrible jobs in bub, uh, pubs and bars uh, and a pasty kiosk in Guildford Station as well. That was my probably my low point. Uh, and so it wasn't uncommon for people to wander into these bars or restaurants and find me actually typing the book out on my mobile phone right. between customers and things like that. So that's how I got it done. Oh, that's yeah. a big, that's that a big. huge, yeah. And that, that's common. But this was before, well, it's sort of just at the rise of smartphones, I think. I can't remember what I was writing on, but it was, uh, I think it was the first generation iPhone or just before. <laughs> I can't remember. But either way, yeah, so that's how I wrote that. And um, that, was, <laughs> that was an education in itself. Yeah. But it was that passion of wanting to escape and wanting to you know, get back to, a, or actually to succeed in a creative industry. Yeah. I think that's a very helpful tip mm. for who any, who, people that may be thinking of writing and have the excuse of I don't have time. Oh, yeah. Because I also may or may not have written a book while I was at a job. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> That's good. And uh, you've got to do it. Oh, you have and, to, and, yeah. Yeah, as long as I don't find out. No, it's just that's the thing. I mean, obviously, don't sacrifice anything to yeah. do it. Um, that's obviously going to get you into trouble. But yeah. absolutely, if you can sacrifice things that won't get you into trouble, yeah. make a little bit of time here and make a little bit of time there. I mean, it's a struggle that so many authors that I you know work with and, and help across the world deal with. Um, it's you know everyone's got a job, <laughs> you know, really. That I that the people that I work with and everyone has to sort of. Uh, push it into the weekends and the evenings and things like that and it does you know a single project a single book can turn into two or three years very very easily uh, especially as over that time you're coming up with new ideas you're figuring out stuff you're learning your writing is getting better so you do tend to find yourself in this vicious circle where you're either not writing or redoing what you've already written yes. and not actually moving towards the finish line yeah. so this is why I say to people write every day no matter if it's a hundred words or a thousand or ten thousand words a day keep writing and don't edit as you write right. yeah then go back afterwards yeah. and that's when you start editing I mean feel free to mess around with a sentence or paragraph beforehand to get yourself back into the flow but I do not edit as I write because yeah that's, that's, <laughs> that's what I learned from that yeah <laughs> so what does a day of writing look like for you a day of solid writing for me literally looks uh, well yeah it looks like getting up at 7 or 8 a.m sitting at the computer and writing until about, well, whenever I get bored, <laughs> which is normally in the evening. That's a solid day of writing for me. Um, I get a couple of those a week now, which is quite nice, but usually I'm working on other projects at the same time. So instead of having a huge block of writing most of the time, I will split between sort of, uh, you know, I might spend the mornings and a bit of the afternoon writing or 
you know, a bit of the afternoon and the evening. And at the other time, I'm working on marketing, I'm working on side projects, uh, other little you know world domination ideas, <laughs> things like that. So yeah, I do do try and split it up so that I'm getting a bit done of or sort of yeah a bit done of every area each day. Uh, but yeah, so an average day would be, yeah, probably 60, 40 writing to marketing. Um, if there's a project coming up to fruition or something like that, it might be 70, 30, 80, 20, uh, with the writing being the small parts at that point. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of an average day for me. Has it taken a while to build that discipline? Yeah, I mean, it's I've been writing now six years, well, writing and publishing six years. Right. Um, and only, uh, well, it was last year, early last year that I went full time on books. Right. Uh, and, and marketing and things like that and obviously trying to make sales <laughs> yeah. and so yeah but obviously that's built up over the years where I can get an income that I can rely on that isn't going to fluctuate majorly and leave me out of pocket but at the same time you know there's other side projects and I do a lot of consultancy as well so those have been building up at the same time so it does take time self-publishing and writing you know, usually <laughs> I'd say 999 times out of a thousand it are not what well, it is not a get rich screen get rich quick scheme do you have any go-to methods for getting the words down? Is, is there any days where it just don't it don't come? It sounds like you've you experienced quite a lot of situations where it just comes out. Yeah, yeah. Is there I'm, any times that doesn't happen? What do you do <laughs> if it doesn't? Yeah, I, hopefully anyone listening is not going to hate me, but I don't really suffer writer's block, um, mainly because writer's block is a thing. I will. I do believe it exists, <laughs> but I believe it's it's sort of it becomes a bigger thing in someone's mind than it actually is. And if you say, "Oh, I've got the block," you get into this mindset where you have the block and you can't write. Yes. So I forcibly don't believe in it <laughs> to therefore not get into that mindset. Mm -hmm. But I have found it very, very easy. Well, I do find it in general very, very easy to write down, and just something will come out no matter what. It's normally the parts. Uh, well, it's normally when I do slow down or get a little bit stuck, it's normally that I've been writing for maybe 2,000, 3,000 words already, you know, for a couple of hours, um, and I sort of start losing my way or thinking, actually, do I need to backtrack and make sure this dialogue goes in that direction or this direction, um, or times when I haven't planned. You know, I, I like I said, I write a huge plan before I start, and I follow it. Um, roughly, I mean, I, I don't. I'm not afraid to let the plan change, but as long as I know the blocks of the book and how they fit together, then I'm happy. And so then I will usually sit down before I write and go, okay, this section needs to. Uh, there needs to be an interaction between these two characters that needs to have this effect. So how do I get there? And I'll sort of have a quick plan before I sit down uh, and read through, you know, the notes that I've made on this chapter or this paragraph, what have you. And that's how I then jump into it. Um, if you don't have that, I think you can struggle. I'm not, unless you, I mean, there are writers out there who write by the seat of their pants, a pantser. I'm a planner. It's <laughs> got <laughs> yeah, a term. Right, pantsers and planners, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so I think, you know, if you are a pantser, then great. But, you know, there will be other times where you just think, how, oh, what am I doing here? And I think that's where a plan really, really helps, right. either just for that moment or for the whole book. But, yeah, I'm the sort of person that plans pretty much everything down. <laughs> that's brilliant. That's, yeah. uh, pantsers that's and planners. Day. Yeah. <laughs> A pantser. Okay. Um, do you have any goal? Do you have any go-to tools for keeping accountable? Ooh. Normally, the word count at the end of the day. When it comes to marketing, uh, sorry, when it comes to writing, so purely creativity, because I think I mean I have a huge amount of marketing goals um, that you know are very metric-focused, numbers-based. Um, but for writing, for the creativity side. It is that word count, yeah. So and you it, have you have a you have a you have a word count at the start of the day. That's it. Must it. Be achieved. That's it. And uh, usually, I mean, that'll be anyway. It'll be a rough one. So sort of, go, I want to do three thousand words today, you right. know, because I know that that will finish off this section or what have you. So, you know, I will stop in the middle of a chapter. I'll stop in the middle of like a paragraph and things like that. Not normally in the middle of a sentence because I can't you do the that. Words. You well, the no, word not count. no. Just because I feel that I'm sort of done for that day, and that's normally around that word count. So I'll, I mean, there have been days where I need to write ten thousand words today, and I'll sort of get to about eight and a half, like I did last week. So I go, I, you know, I'm done. <laughs> so it is very flexible. But I set a goal, and I will get to it, 
or well, I get my, I try my hardest to get to it. If I do, sometimes I'll go over. If I don't quite, then at least I've done some writing, you know, per day. So yeah, it's it's a loose target, but um, yeah, it's never really section based or plot based. It's always just a mount <laughs> for me, which I find is the most inspiring thing. Okay, yeah. the numbers work. work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> different kind of numbers to marketing, but still. <laughs> I don't know if this is a tactic, but I thought this was I thought this was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I was looking at content. You speak to your readers yeah. through YouTube. Yeah. And you say this is going to be done by this time. <laughs> yeah. Now is is that a conscious thing whereby you said that now publicly, yeah. so yeah. it has to happen? I feel is that very. Part of it? I think so. I feel very accountable to my fans. Right. And if I've said I'm going to do something, I either do it or just say it's either coming a little bit later or apologize right. and it's not being done. But yeah, I mean, my fans are the guys and girls who have gone out and bought my books, paid money, have bothered to follow me on Twitter and Facebook, or you know. Uh, reach out to me via email, leave a review, whatever, you know, whatever interaction that they've had with me via my books or with me personally, you know, I want to thank them for that. And I, you know, also know that that's going to be my future revenue as well. Um, so for me, it's, yeah, I feel very accountable to my fans. And yeah, so if I do that sometimes, I know I have to do it. For instance, in the back of my mind now, I know that I've said uh, I've got a video about my time in Barcelona last week coming up, so I've got to do that tomorrow. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I've also said in that that a short story will be out in that week, so I know that I've got to uh, finish and sort of get a short story out, which is luckily only about 3,000 words. So, <laughs> but That's yeah. It's a strong tactic. It is a strong tactic, I mean, yeah. Of course it's not. It's, it's, also, it's, keep, it's keeping everyone informed yeah. of what's going on. Yeah. I would feel big pressure to, to deliver. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's why you've got to be a bit careful with it. And that's right. why, you know, there are times I said, actually, guys, yeah, this is going to be next week. And, you know, um, that does happen, you know, often. You know, <laughs> But I will always then try and get it on ASAP or advise people when it's happening and things like that. And everyone gets excited and puts a tweet up about what they're doing and realize, oh, actually, that's going to be a bit longer than I thought. There's nothing wrong with that. That's just yeah. human nature. Um, but it's also a tactic I use in my to-do list as well. If it goes on my to-do list, it has to be done. Mm -hmm. And so I live off my to-do list. I've got four to-do lists spread over marketing, big projects, um, sort of week, uh, week, weekly tasks and daily tasks. And things move between them constantly. So I'm always going to do that. You know, it's very rarely that I'll, I'll delete something off of my to-do list. Um, I'll just move it into another one, so I'm always keeping track of it. So when are you making those lists? They're weekly? Uh, daily, hourly, weekly, right. yearly, yeah. <laughs> so they're just continually shifting? It's always, like, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. And the good thing about Apple as well, um, for your iPhones and things like that, reminders, because that's what I use uh, right. for my to-do list, it keeps track of everything you've ever completed. Right. So if I ever get a little bit down and go, oh, I haven't got done much today, I just go <laughs> onto my reminders, scroll down, it says 4,236 things completed <laughs> over the last couple of years. <laughs> No. Yeah, and I can scroll through and go, oh yeah, I did do that. Yeah, <laughs> If I'm ever feeling down, that's always fun. But I think it's, yeah, um, having some sort of organization to your time, yeah. I think is, is, you know, is paramount, especially if you're juggling jobs and things like that. And you only know you've got two hours in the evening. You want to be able to sit down and go, right, I'm spending half an hour on social media. I'm going to spend an hour and a half on writing, things like that. Yeah, so... Obviously, you are a self-publishing consultant. Consultant, yes. So it'd be great to jump into that. I'm sure you experienced this yourself. Once I published a book, I had quite a few people yeah. over the course of a year or so come mm -hmm. and say, "How did you do it?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, how easy is it today to self-publish? Easier than it's ever been, and it continues to get easier. The hard parts are the writing and actually self-publishing correctly, uh, or at least in the most beneficial way uh, for your career. So those are the hard parts. Um, it's a very simple process when you break it down. You know, I break it, uh, my shelf help method is a DIY method that focuses on three parts. You said good things come in threes, that's why I completely agree. <laughs> um, you know, so I look at polishing, which is the process of taking your Word file that you've been, you know, pouring over over the last two, three years or what have you, and actually turning it into something that looks like a book. And that's, that is the first step. You cannot get anywhere. You can't just upload a Word file so you know, to Amazon. Formatting. That's it, formatting, typesetting, but also the editing. Uh, also the editing, uh, cover design as well. So you have to look at all the elements of a traditionally published book and think, well, how do I get there? 
you know, and that's the polishing stage. From that, you're looking at publishing. So what you want to be doing there is, you know, figuring out, well, how do I get this thing that looks like a book in front of other book readers or with other books? And so that's the publishing stage. And that is the very, very easy part of self-publishing. That's the taking those files and just uploading them onto retailers such as Amazon, Kobo, iBooks, or print-on-demand platforms like Ingram, Spark, and CreateSpace. So that, that's the easiest and the quickest part, and also the funnest part. <laughs> then the real, I suppose, the only hardest part of self-publishing, which you could argue is not technically part of self-publishing, it's the third P, the promotion, uh, or the marketing stage. And that's less step-by-step, -step, more amorphous, you know, never-ending technically, because you can always keep marketing yourself. Uh, and that's the bit that a lot of people find the hardest alongside the writing. So sort of two real difficult bookends and some real nice, easy, rewarding stuff in the middle. <laughs> okay. That's it, yeah. So, I mean, that's what I'd say about self-publishing, but there has never been a better time to be an author. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I'm going to be giving a talk on this uh, later on, yeah. <laughs> and I cannot wait to share some of the statistics. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, I stole Ben away, incidentally. He's going to give a, a public speaking session later. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about the difference between vanity publishing mm. in, in, in the past. So yeah. I think that'd be, yeah, I think that's interesting to, to know a little bit. What's, what's the difference between mm. vanity publishing of the past yeah. and self-publishing today, do you think? <laughs> well, I mean, broadly speaking, when you look at it historically, uh, vanity publishing was something set up um, to cater for the people that wanted to go independent or couldn't get published back in the day. You know, obviously the publishing industry is not a new one. The self-publishing industry is reasonably young, um, but you know, publishing has been going on for over a hundred years. You know, um, so what what generally used to happen is that those people who couldn't be published would be pointed um, to another company. Usually, <coughs> well, not usually, but sometimes in the same building. You know, almost in the, under the same name as the as the tr traditional publisher. Uh, and they would be these authors would be sort of pointed towards these companies going oh no they'll still publish you what that actually meant is they'll print you no. so vanity publishing in general sort of evokes an image of an author who's had to do a print run for themselves hence the name vanity in vain um, to then sell by hand or to try and negotiate their own distribution or their own stocking or you know essentially do it all themselves mm -hmm. but however you know this is pre I would say vanity started to die out late 90s, early 2000s. I mean, at least the term did. Um, and so that would be essentially the only thing you could do before self-publishing. Do a massive print run, spend anywhere between 1,000 to 10,000 pounds on, a, you know, on, a, on those books, probably only sell a couple, find it really hard, and then you know, leave them to rot in your garage. You know, that's essentially the old image of an indie author. Then, of course, the internet came along and changed everything, and now technology has made it completely viable. So no more of those rotting books. Nope. <laughs> what do you think are the most powerful tools for a self-publisher? Determination, professionalism, and I would say, ooh, should we go for three? Yeah, let's go for three. <laughs> um, determination, professionalism, and I think an ability Oh, this is a really difficult one, Robin. <laughs> uh, I think an ability to look at the market and find out what works and what isn't working, especially in the marketing set, in the side of things. So I think you need to be able to read the market and understand how, or how and why something becomes a bestseller and why people read books and tap into that. And if you can, yeah. So maybe a little bit of creativity when it comes to the marketing side. Or to be honest, anything else outside of writing. <laughs> and given what you know now about self-publishing, what would you what would you advise yourself to do before mm. you did your first book? <laughs> if I could go back and slap myself around the face back <laughs> in two thousand and nine, yeah. it'd be edit the thing better. <laughs> okay. I mean, I was skint when I was first publishing I mean because I was working those sort of terrible jobs and I didn't I was still technically a music student back then so I relied on beta readers which is very similar to sort of uh, the gaming term beta testers you have a small pool of people who should have um, a good knowledge of, of writing and the you know the English language and grammar and things like that and they together like a many hands make light work approach can edit your book and beta reading is very useful can it get up to the actual professional edited standards? I do. 
No, is, is the answer. Um, you know, again, 999 times out of 1,000. So I made the mistake of, of depending solely on beta readers. So unfortunately, quite a few mistakes did slip through the net on my first publication. Um, but then I re-edited it, re-released it, and then did that, I think, once or twice more. <laughs> but um, yeah, editor. I'd, even if you have to get a loan, that's what I would have told myself. I'd go back and said, borrow some more money from your parents, sell something, <laughs> you know, do whatever you can uh, to actually pay for an editor. Because it makes so much of a difference. It really does. Because, I mean, I've still got reviews hanging around on my old editions on Amazon that's mentioned poor editing and things like that. So that is the, one of the number one things, as well as a book cover, I'd say, that sinks a self-published book, no matter how good its story is. So, you know, you could write the next... Yeah, masterpiece of a generation but if it's riddled with mistakes and poor grammar you just you know it's not going to go anywhere those are nuggets yeah okay um, we need to round up so I'm going to ask you some quick five bonus questions let's do it on a scale of one to ten how weird are you eleven eleven okay. <laughs> what would someone who doesn't like you say about you Good. Uh, probably a little bit too weird <laughs> I'd probably say yeah it works too much or um why is it always head buried into his computer? <laughs> Your favourite quote? Oh God! Um, there are no rules of an uh, sorry. There are no rules of architecture for a castle in the clouds. Oh. I've even got it tattooed on me. I like it. I like <laughs> it's a G.K. Chesterton quote. What are your plans during a zombie apocalypse? Get somewhere high with a weapon that doesn't use ammunition because then you can't run out of it, and choose something like a katana or something with a long handle and a long blade. Right, and, a spear. Yeah, something like that that you don't need ammo for and that you can, I don't know, make you some space about with. This. I did steal it from a good zombie survival guide I read a little while ago <laughs> where they said that is, you know, for all the theories, that's the best one. Open, you know, high place that you can see things coming and a no, no ammunition weapon. Okay. Uh, you can have three people living or dead round for dinner. <laughs> J.R. Tolkien. <laughs> Instantly. Uh, da Vinci. I've always been obsessed a little bit with Da Vinci. I can't be obsessed a little bit. I've always been obsessed with Da Vinci. Oh, good one. Um, Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks. <laughs> yeah, why not? Off the top of my head. That's it's my favourite actor. That's yeah. going to be a good one. That could be fun, couldn't it? <laughs> Last bonus question. What's your view on gherkins? I hate them. Okay. Disgusting things. Right. Yeah. So, when you were going to McDonald's, they'd come out of the burger. You'd always get a fresh burger that way. Okay. Yeah, they'd have to remake it. They'd have to sort of not <laughs> keep it in the packet and pick things out. They'd have to make you a fresh one. Brilliant. <laughs> ben, I have enjoyed this immensely. People want to find out about you. Mm -hmm. What should they do? You can either go onto my sort of books website, which is www.bengalley.com, which is G-A-L-L-E-Y. If you want self-publishing, um, I do. I have online courses. I also do monthly chats as well via video. Uh, you can find me at shelfhelp.info. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Bengali or at uh, on Facebook Bengali Author, and Instagram as well Bengali. <laughs> Excellent, man. I thoroughly enjoyed this, and Thank you. we wish you. Loads of success, Thank as you if you much. need us to wish you success. <laughs> Thank you. May even be even more successful. So thanks Good. a lot. Thank you very much, Robin. It's been Real an absolute pleasure. pleasure to be on. Hey, guys and gals, before you go, I want to take the chance to tell you about the Mindful Leaders Starter Kit. Now, you can get this for free when you sign up for updates at warriorstrategy.com. This kit includes the eight Tai Chi Performance Enhancers PDF, a punchy little qigong routine which is on video and a guided mindfulness audio track as i say you can get this for free when you sign up for updates at warriorstrategy.com this is robin gamble thanking you for listening hoping you enjoyed the content and kindly asking you to share with your friends if you did thanks again and see you next time